In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. I'd like to welcome you all to our Perseverance conversation this morning. Great to be with you. And as always, we like to begin our conversation with inviting Mary to be with us. Mary is the mother of God, Mary is the mother of the church, and Mary is the mother of each and every one of us. We also call out to Mary as our life, our sweetness, and our hope. So let's say the prayer that Mary loves most. This prayer is the angelic salutation. We call also this prayer the Hail Mary. So together, this day in which we honor Mary, let's say the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now that the hour of our death. Amen. Now, of course, we'd like to invite our spiritual director to be with us, and that spiritual director is the Holy Spirit. He has many titles among which would be the Holy Spirit is the paraclete. Holy Spirit is also known as the gift of gifts. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sweet guest of our souls. The Holy Spirit is also known as the sanctifier, he who makes us holy. Holy Spirit is also known as the Counselor, as well as our Consoler. The Holy Spirit is known also as the Finger of God. Holy Spirit is also known as the Interior Master. He's the one that teaches us how to pray. As St. Paul says, we don't know how to pray as we ought. But the Holy Spirit intercedes with ineffable groans, so we can say, Abba. Abba, which means Daddy or Father. So let's beg the Holy Spirit to give us a lot of light, a lot of joy, interior fire to burn within our hearts. As we say this prayer, come Holy Spirit. Fill the hearts of your faithful and then kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same spirit may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Michael, pray for us. St. Gabriel, pray for us. St. Raphael, pray for us. St. Nasha Loyola, pray for us. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. Jacinta, pray for us. St. Francisco, pray for us. All God's angels and saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. So as always, I'd like to encourage you by prayer. And I'd like to pray for all of you in our Perseverance family. And pray for you in what is called Opus Dei. Opus Dei means the work of God. Opus Dei is the work of God. That's right. That is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. My first intention will be related to what we celebrate November 1st. It's the Solemnity of All Saints that all of us are called to become saints. 
Jesus himself says, Be holy as your heavenly Father is holy. That all of us who take seriously are called to become saints. Fifth chapter of the Dogmatic Constitution from Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, is the universal call to holiness. We're all called to become saints. <clears throat> So we want to work on that. We want to collaborate with God's grace and really make a concerted effort to really grow in holiness in our lives. We would die to sin so that we could live to a new life. May Mary's prayers help us in this interior battle that we have to undergo. My second intention will be I'd like to pray for your families. Especially I'd like to pray for your children as well as your teenagers. We are really going through a difficult time in the world in which many families are being rent asunder for many reasons. One of the primary reasons that families are not praying together because a family that prays together stays together. How true that is. I finished a consecration to Mary on Monday, and the whole thrust of the consecration was Our Lady Fatima to get the families to come together, to pray together, to talk about spiritual things together, specifically the message of Fatima. I'd like to pray for you that your your children, your teenagers, would have this intellectual conviction in their minds that true happiness comes from our relationship with God. St. Thomas Aquinas had a vision of God at the end of his life, and he said everything else is just straw and hay. They were blown away by the wind. Jesus himself said, What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? And principal foundation that most of you know pretty well teaches us the following, that purpose of our life is on earth is to praise God. That's the purpose of our life, is to praise God. To reverence our neighbor, reverence God rather. To serve God by means of that to save our souls. So the purpose of our life on earth is really to get to heaven. That's why we're here. We're here to get to heaven. So my last intention would be I'd like to pray that all of us would make an effort to pray better, to be faithful to our prayer period. What can help us in our prayer? Well, the month of November, as well as the message of Fatima, can be of great help. That would be to meditate upon, often to meditate upon, the last things. The last, th last things would be the reality of death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory and all of that is imbued or enveloped in the concept of eternity eternity means forever and ever and ever and ever no end so those will be my prayers for all of you this this morning today
Okay, my friends, today is the first Friday of the month dedicated to Mary, but I'd also like to follow up on our conversation, our catechesis on the reality of purgatory. Yesterday, I gave an extensive talk on indulgences, plenary indulgences, and how to acquire that. So that was a, a good part of my conversation yesterday. So I'd like to build upon the whole concept of of purgatory. As this month, the month of November, we should be praying in a special way for the souls in purgatory. Not that we should not be praying for them outside of November, but this is a special month dedicated to purgatory. So my Catechesis on purgatory today will be biblical. I invite all of you to try to memorize the basic um, biblical passage on purgatory from the Old Testament. So I'll give you the passage and then invite all of you to try to try to get to know this passage. So we go back to the Old Testament, the book that time period, which is about 100 years before the coming of Christ, pretty close to Christ. It's called the Maccabees. The Protestants do not have the books of Maccabees. We do as Catholics. There are two books. Okay, where do we find purgatory in the book of Maccabees? It's in the second book of Maccabees. The second book of Maccabees. And this specific chapter, so I'd like to just uh, make sure that you get it. So the second book of Maccabees, there's Maccabees 1 and 2. And this chapter, so here we have where you can find you can go and find this in your Bible sometime today. 2 Maccabees chapter 12. 2 Maccabees chapter 12. Okay, what do we have there? Let me give you the overall context. Okay, the Jewish armies are fighting valiantly against their enemies. They have been surrounded by enemy armies, and they're putting up a valiant fight with Judas. Judas is the uh, general-in-chief, very intelligent, strong, spiritual, holy man, who's basically fighting for God and fighting against idolatry in the pagan nations. So after a battle in which the Jewish people have won this battle, they're going to have to confront another enemy. So they find that these dead soldiers have these talismans, these good luck charms, these idols of Jamnia. So many of the soldiers in the army of Judas, knowing that they should not do this because this is a practice of idolatry, they take the talisman, the good luck charm, off the dead soldiers that are lying on the ground. Then they put it over their neck beneath, beneath their own tunics. That's right. And this was most likely their intention, that they had to fight a very 
uh, fierce army the following battle. And they were fearful. Very fearful. So they put this good luck charm on with the intention that this good luck charm would protect them against their enemies and give them good luck. <clears throat> in other words, they're going to trust more in this good luck charm than in God himself. They knew in the depths of their hearts that they were doing wrong. However, they were filled with fear. You might even say paralyzed with fear. So they go and go off into battle and many of them fall by the sword. They're killed. So what does Judas do? Judas, the commander in chief, he goes about the battlefield and he's inspecting his dead soldiers. What he does, he lifts up the tunic and he noticed what was hanging around the neck of these dead soldiers was the talisman of Jamnia. So he understood. He, so he understood the reason why these men fell by the sword was because they did not trust God, but rather they placed their trust in a physical object. And by placing their trust in the physical object, God recoiled from their presence. And they basically had to fight by themselves. They basically had to fight, wage the war by themselves. And they were overpowered by the enemy and they were killed. Now Judas, a, a, a very spiritual man, as were a very kind man, he recognized this. His dead soldiers were not bad men. But they were men that had fears. And they were overcome by fear of the army that defeated them. So they are paralyzed by fear. Instead of calling upon God to win the battle, they relied upon this good luck charm. So Judas decides to make a collection. He makes a collection of 2,000 talents, which would be a lot of money, which he decides to send to Jerusalem so that the priests in the temple of Jerusalem could offer sacrifices for these dead soldiers. So that these dead soldiers could be freed from their sins. So, let's analyze this passage. Because Judas believed in the resurrection of the dead. This was a very, very pleasing gesture to God because he believed in the, in the resurrection of the dead. And they believed by offering these sacrifices that they would be freed from the bondage of their sins. So how do we how do we interpret this? It's pretty simple. Now, if these dead soldiers were in hell, all the prayers in the world are useless. Because those who are condemned to hell will never escape hell. It's an eternal punishment. Now, if they're already in heaven, 
There's no purpose to pray for the souls that have gone to heaven. We don't pray for them, we pray to them. So if they're not in they're not in hell and they're not in heaven, they have to they have to be in some other place because we believe in the immortality of the soul. Once the body dies, the soul will go on living forever. So they must be in some intermediate place between hell and heaven, and that we call purgatory. So that's the whole interpretation of this passage. And once again, I repeat, encourage all of you to sometime later today, go to the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, where you have Judas making, Judas Maccabees making a collection to free the dead from their sins so that they would participate in the life of the resurrection. Okay, my friends, today we have the conclusion of the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. We've been reading that the past three weeks. We have Psalm 145. We're into Luke chapter 16, where Jesus gives a an instruction on the importance of being trustworthy, not trusting in wealth and money. One of the things that really struck me in the letter of St. Paul is he mentions just a lot of names. He mentions a lot of names. And I remember as a young priest, I had arrived in Argentina and Father Tim Gallagher was there. And one thing that he said was his importance in dealing with people pastorally to try to make an effort, try to make an effort to learn the names of the people. By doing that, we're showing that we honor that person, we respect that person. So in our dealings with people, not just saying, hey you, Che, hey you, come here. Hey you, hey you, that doesn't, build up the person at all. But if you call the person Patricia, or Sophie, or Jeff, or Martha, or Mark, I call you by name, that, uh, that shows respect for the person in his innate goodness and individuality. So St. Paul is going to be mentioning a lot of different names. For example, it says, Greet Ampliatus. Some names are pretty long and difficult to pronounce. So, you were called by name. You're important. From your mother's womb, you are called by name to be a prophet to the, all the nations, as is said of Jeremiah. But we all have our own names, and we choose a confirmation name. We should respect our names, and also the importance of when babies are baptized, to give them, to give them a Christian name. Rabbi, I see before me on the screen, Patricia, that would be St. Patrick. Sophie, that would be Sophia, in Greek would be wisdom. So it's important that we, we, we know the, the meaning of our names. It's important we know the meaning of our names. Martha, we, we know St. Martha in the Bible, which is the sister of Mary. 
known for her great hospitality toward Jesus Christ. So, St. Paul, he ends his letter by preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That should be our desire. That our desire to get to know Jesus Christ, to love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to meditate upon his life, to get to know his teaching, to assimilate his teaching, to put into practice his teaching. To put into practice his teaching. So then the response to real psalm is, I will praise your name forever, Lord. This is taken from Psalm 145. I'll praise your name forever, Lord. There's a lot in that antiphon. Praise. My friends, of all the different forms of prayer that exist, there are different modes or forms of prayer that exist. That of, that of praise is the highest form of prayer that exists. I repeat, Praise. Praise is the highest form of prayer that exists. Actually, the highest choirs of angels in heaven, the cherubim and the seraphim, these are the highest choirs of angels in heaven. What do they do? They are praising God for all eternity in heaven. They're praising God for all eternity in heaven. That's right. What about this? What about this? What is the greatest form of prayer in the whole world? You know by now. Greatest form of prayer in the whole world is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. What is the holy sacrifice of the Mass? It is that prayer that unites heaven to earth. That's right. It's the prayer that unites heaven to earth. So if we really want to praise God, we really want to praise God by going to Mass, participating in Mass is the highest form of prayer. We actually can sing as priests, through Him and with Him and in Him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. That is the highest form of prayer. The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. And I was just singing for you. What was I doing? I was singing for you. The, what's called the doxology. Doxology mean uh, doxology actually means praise. Calling to praise God. So the response to real psalm is, I will praise your name forever, Lord. Then 
we arrive at the gospel and the gospel is very rich as always and i'd like to just highlight two ideas from the gospel jesus speaks about being trustworthy being faithful being trustworthy, being faithful. This can be understood and lived out in many ways. We should all pray for the grace to be faithful to our promises, to be faithful to our commitments, to be faithful to our vows. Years ago, it was shortly before my ordination to the priesthood, I was talking with my confessor in the Basilica of St. Mary Major in Rome. I had a Dominican confessor in St. Mary Major. It was an English priest who was named Father Horn, an elderly English Dominican priest. I go to confession to him uh, almost every week. And I told him I was going to be ordained by John Paul II. He congratulated me, prayed for me, but he also said this. So let me give you this advice. At the end of your life, the end of your life, the end of your priesthood, What's most important will not be honors, accolades, praises, having a big name for yourself. That's not the important thing. And at the end of your life, what will be important was whether or not you were a faithful servant of the Lord. a faithful servant of the Lord. That's what's most important. That you be faithful to your priesthood, faithful to your religious life, faithful to your religious commitment, faithful to your vows, faithful to what you promise to God. I think we can maybe stop and ask ourselves, are we trying to be faithful to God also? Most of you uh, in this Perseverance family conversation, you're not priests or religious or nuns, but you're lay people. John Paul II wrote a document for lay people called Christi Fideli Laici which means you're called to be faithful to Christ. And John Paul II says that you're called to be the light of the world and, to, and the salt of the earth. Many of you have made a commitment to another person through the vows of marriage. Would you promise to be faithful in good times as well as in bad? In health as well as sickness? Riches as well as poverty? Until death do you part? There's the promise that most of you made. Therefore, it's a good idea every year to, on your anniversary, to renew this promise. And also, it's even a good idea that you renew this promise and you renew this commitment by having a Mass celebrated on the anniversary of your wedding date. As I do every May 25th, I celebrate another year of the priesthood. 
renewing my commitment to try to live out my priesthood more fully. These are holy reminders. We have to strive to be faithful in good times as well as bad, in health as well as sickness, riches as well as poverty, until the Lord calls us from this life to the next. I'd like to tell you a story of faithfulness. That's the message in the Gospel today. Jesus wants us to be trustworthy. By trustworthy, it really means to be faithful. A trustworthy person is faithful. His word is worthy of trust. Here's the story. I have a wedding later on today. I might even use this in the wedding. It's a great story of marital faithfulness. And here's the story. On one occasion, a family invited a priest to go to their house for dinner. So the priest accepted the invitation and that day the priest did not have a car. So the husband decided that he was willing to go and pick up the priest, because the priest did not have the priest did not have transportation. So, on the way to the house, the man was praising his wife for her goodness, for her kindness for her beauty, for her hard work, for her greatness as a mother, as well as a, a spouse. So during the whole journey from the rectory of the priest to the house, the husband was praising his wife. And the priest was taken aback because often in the context of the pastoral work he would do, many would come to complain about their spouses rather than to praise them. So they arrive at the house and the husband rings the doorbell and the wife opens up the door and the priest notices that the wife has a scarred face. The right side of her face is totally scarred. So the wife warmly greets the priest and the father invites the priest to sit down for dinner. There at dinner was the husband, the wife, and a little girl who was about six years eight, six years old. And during the meal time, the man was praising his wife left and right, just heaping compliments upon his wife. And the priest was just taken aback to see how much love this man had for his wife. The little daughter had a big smile on her face listening to the lively conversation. They had one daughter who was about six. Now after the meal was finished, 
And the husband was taking the priest back to his rectory. With prudence and discretion, the priest asked this question. Actually, what happened to your wife, the fact that she had this, this scar on her face? And the, uh, the husband said, oh, father, I'll tell you. About six years ago, in our house, we had a fire. And the fire was in the bedroom where our little daughter was, who was about six months in the bassinet. The room was on fire, as well as the blankets of my little daughter was on fire. So my wife rushed into the room, grabbed onto the blanket where my little daughter was, and the fire scathed and, and cut her face, burned her face. For that reason, Father, I have the most beautiful wife in the world. For that reason, Father, I have the most beautiful wife in the world. What does this story teach us, my friends? The importance of being trustworthy. The importance of being faithful. The importance of when we give our word we will be faithful to our words. The faithful that our words and our actions will complement each other. So let's step back and look at our own lives. And ask ourselves, are we faithful to our commitments? Are we faithful to our promises? Are we faithful to our vows? Are we faithful to God? Are we faithful to our spouse? Are we faithful to our family? Are we faithful to our work commitments? Are we faithful to our own personal proposals, our own plan of life. If we can say, yes, we are, let's humbly tell God, thank you. But if in all honesty, we look at our lives and recognize that we have failed in many ways, well, starting today, Starting today, let's change. Starting today, let's try all of us to be faithful to our commitments right now. <coughs> right now. It's never too late. Nunc Chepi. That's why our God is a God of second chances. That's why we have the sacrament of confession, so that we can return through the embrace of our loving Father. It's never too late. Then the Gospel ends where Jesus says, you cannot serve two masters. Now the time of Jesus, the most extended social class would be that of slaves. So families would have slaves and the slave, the slave was totally dedicated to his master. So understand that passage, if you understand the whole social stratus in the time of Jesus. So a slave could not 
uh, could not be serving two masters at the same time. That would be impossible. For that reason, Jesus says he'll either hate one and love the other and be devoted to one to despise the other. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. Then Jesus goes on to say you cannot serve God and mammon, which means money at the same time. So the passage ends with the Pharisees, the Pharisees who are, who are listening to our Lord's conversation. And they, they really loved money. They really loved money. They were greedy, avaricious. So because of what our Lord said, you cannot serve God and money at the same time. These Pharisees, they start to sneer at our Lord. They're derisive. They ridicule our Lord. And then Jesus goes on to say, you, he goes on to say, you justify yourselves in the sight of others. But God knows your hearts. God knows your hearts. My friends, we can lie to others. My friends, we can lie to ourselves. My friends, we can even lie to the lie detector. We can do that. We can lie to others. We can lie to ourselves. We can lie to the lie detector. But none of us can lie to God and fool God. We can't do that. None of us should try to take God as a fool. Not only does God see everything in the whole world, God sees not only the exterior actions of every person that lives in the world. That's so true. But also, God also is able to read the hearts of every individual person on planet Earth. God can even read our hearts. Even the most secret of our intentions, God knows them. As if the sun were beaming down on us on midday. And Jesus says that what is of human esteem is an abomination in the sight of God. So we should try to please God. Put God above everything. Here's another story for you. And the message of the story is, we can't please everyone, but we should try to please God. The story I'd like to tell you is taken from Tolstoy. Tolstoy, you probably know, was a... Um, one of the greatest Russian novelists, Leo Tolstoy. He wrote the famous novel, War and Peace. Tol Tol okay, the, the whole message of this story is we cannot please everyone, but we have to try to please God. And it's this. There is a cook who is preparing the meal for his master. And the cook has some leftovers 
and it would be that of entrails, it would be maybe some of the extra gristle or meat. And the cook takes it and he throws it outside the door. The entrails, the gristle, some of the extra meat. And he throws it outside and the dogs, they're waiting outside and they pounce upon the entrails of maybe the chicken or maybe the, the cow, whatever it is, and they smell it and they eat it. And the dogs say, this cook is a really good cook. The dogs are complimenting the cook because he's throwing out what is the extra meat and the, what is edible. So they really compliment the cook. following day, the cook just throws out the shells and the pods and uh, the husks, throws that out the door. This time the dogs come up and they look at the husks and the pods and the remainders of the corn husks. In other words, it's not even edible. So now the dogs say, this is a lousy cook. The cook goes on to say, it's not my job to please the dogs. It's my job to please the master of the house. It's a great story. It's a great story because the message of this story, my friends, is what Jesus says in the Gospel today. In the Gospel today. And it's this. You cannot serve two masters at the same time. You can't serve God and money at the same time. You can't say you're going to be serving God and just giving in to your own sinful passions at the same time. You can't do that. You have to make the choice either to serve God or to serve mammon. Mammon is the word for money or material things. We have to make that decision. And hopefully you'll make the decision of what was the gospel last Sunday. The teacher comes up to Jesus and says, Lord, what is the greatest of all commandments? Jesus goes on to say, quoting the Shema, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. So serving God and mammon, we have to make the choice. For that reason, we honor the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's right. We honor Mary. The first Saturday of the month we dedicate to Mary. Here we have a beautiful picture of Our Lady dressed in white. Behind her, behind her is a cloud. Kneeling before her are three little shepherd children. These three little shepherd children, two of them are already canonized. They are Lucia de los Santos, the older one, and her two cousins. 
Jacinta and Francisco. Jacinta and Francisco to the right, do you see? They are already canonized saints. Pope Francis canonized them in the year 2017, the hundredth anniversary of the first apparition, May 13th, to Our Lady, uh, Our Lady to the Children. So, if there's anyone that ever really lived out the gospel, was not double-minded. It was Mary. Mary was trustworthy. Mary was faithful. Mary was transparent. Mary was filled with love. So today is the first Saturday of the month. Try to live out the promises of Our Lady Fatima. Make your confession. Make your confession. Go to Mass today. Offer your communion in reparation for the sins against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Pray the Rosary today. Because the family that prays together stays together. Spend some time reading maybe a book on the mysteries of the rosary to get to know the mysteries of the rosary better. You might even re read my book of Consecration of Mary through the mystery of the rosary. So you can carry out the first five Saturdays of the month. So my friends, we've had a very good conversation today on this first Saturday of the month. I will pray for you, invite all of you to pray for me. And I'd like to give all of you my priestly blessing. And that would be, the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless all of you in a very special way through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. May God bless all of you in a special way in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.